cases, um, including in some cases, as you'll see, um, not using periods of these sentences. So um, I did not include periods where they didn't exist, but I have separated the space so that you can see where one sentence ends. It took me a long time to figure out how to read um, just on the sentence level. Um, I mean, some have some you know, dashes or whatever, but others have nothing. So it just depended on who was doing the transcription. Anyway. <clears throat> no, so this is Mr. Franklin's response to the question, did you observe any disobedience? And he says, no, the children were always quiet and were provoked by the school's newly appointed headmaster, Mr. Davis. On Monday the 7th of April, Mr. Davis invited me to teach in his room, saying the children are in excellent order and you can join one in teaching. I then took my Hebrew class from half past two to three o'clock in Mr. Davis's room. At three o'clock, the girls entered the schoolroom, upon which Mr. Davis gave a lesson in English, uh, in English reading to the girls and boys together. The girls had not finished the first line of the book when Mr. Davis called me over. At this moment, both boys and girls were very quiet. When Mr. Davis, pointing with his finger to Rachel Kraft, said, where are your lies now? To Rebecca Lewis, he stated, where is your smile now? Where is your something unreadable now? Phoebe Belasco, in looking up at Mr. Davis, lost the place in the book. On Mr. Davis discovering this, he took her by the arm and saying, now, young liar, go out, thrust her from the room after this. Mr. Davis requested the girls on the bench to move up higher. When Elizabeth Blumenthal moved the contrary way, he then slapped her very hard on her eye with the back of his hand, so that she suffered for 10 days after from the effects of the blow. To some extent, Mr. Franklin's testimony coheres with what we might expect to find in a Victorian orphanage, where evidence suggests children were routinely starved or beaten. However, the Jews' orphan asylum archive troubles that old story in important ways. To begin with, we may wonder about a teacher who states that the children were always quiet, even if such children ever existed. Franklin maintains that Davis not only physically abused the children, but accused the students of lying, stating, um, Franklin claims, uh, Davis said to them, where are your lies now? And now, young liar, go out. In response to the investigator's question, what remedies do you suggest for the student's disturbances? Instead of slapping the face of a girl for moving in the wrong direction, she might only have been sent from the classroom or an extra lesson given, which still seems harsh by my standards, but um, this is another error. Uh, Mr. Franklin's show of reason makes a powerful argument. Later testimony, however, leads us to question these earlier statements. In a letter dated the 11th of February, 1857, a woman named P. Abraham submitted a lengthy, unsolicited letter to the committee for the third investigation, in which she recounts abuse her sister Esther received as an inmate at the school. Uh, P. Abrahams explains that her sister, just, uh, um, explains that her sister, in consequence of an accident with a servant, and some of Mr. Franklin's children was beaten most unmercifully, so much so that she ran from the asylum and came to me covered with bruises and marks. Mr. Franklin, finding that my sister had run away in consequence of this brutality, he came to my house and after his usual fashion, entreated her to return by promises of presents and money, saying that an exposure would ruin him and cause his dismissal from his situation. P. Abraham's letter continues with additional examples of Mr. Franklin's abuse of her sisters and other girls at the asylum. She adds that her sisters, quote, were all more or less beaten, often bruised, often had black eyes. Numerous other documents in this archive make similar allegations, claiming that Mr. and Mrs. Franklin not only physically abused the children, but used money and presents to manipulate students into covering up such abuses. Yet in other letters, or in testimony, it's the students who confessed to lying, especially in moments when they were threatened with punishments. Lying seemed to have offered the 
a way of pushing back, not only for safety, but to further their sense of justice and ethical action. Read within the context of the lying archive, Meyer Davis's accusations relayed in Franklin's testimony are probably true. I suspect the students had lied on previous occasions. What we can't tell from this single document, however, is what forces prompted their lies, or why the students thought those lies would grant them control. It's only when we read the documents relationally as a tangled network of perspectives and voices told at different points in time do we have a chance of hearing the forces that shape both the content and rhetoric of the archive's individual narratives. It is possible, then, to hear individuated EastEnders in an archive that speak relationally, I'm sorry, let me start that again. Um, is it possible, then, to hear individuated EastEnders in an archive that speaks relationally as an entangled network? And what can such a reading practice illuminate about the 19th century East End. We might think here of Mayhew's nameless street sellers, of John Thompson's photographs of the poor, passive East Enders standing in dirty streets without shoes, or of social deviants like Dickens' Fagin or Jack the Ripper. The East End, we've been led to believe, is a place where people are either nameless victims downtrodden by poverty or murderous perpetrators. In contrast, the Jews' orphan asylum are recovers individual citizens with names, addresses, ages, children, and with, <clears throat> with a desire to write, speak, and be heard. Although fragmentary, these voices nevertheless revise or challenge our knowledge of the East End. In order to trace signs of the real amidst the fragments and lies, I turn to our let Burgess work on the problem of locating versions of reality in the archive. As she explains, Uh, as she explains, what we encounter are incomplete discourses given under duress, are elements of society, um, and they help to characterize it, being forced to talk in an effort to avoid prison, deciding to confess or not, hurling oneself into debate against the authorities. These are marks of singular fates. Therefore, even if the discourse is muddled, mixing lies and the truth, hatred and cunning, submission and defiance, does not diminish the truth that it carries. The archives do not necessarily tell the truth, but as Michel Foucault would say, they tell of the truth, namely the unique way in which they expose the mode of speech of an individual, wedged between the relationships of power and herself, relationships to which she is subjected and that she actuates by expressing verbally. Farge's method opens up possibilities for locating and interpreting modes of speech, rhetorical strategies, or writing practices in the writing and testimony of the Jews' orphan asylum archive, rather than read the characters in this drama as insignificant unknowns who appear briefly for a page or two before vanishing from the historical record. I focus on the way the writing or spoken testimonies not only individuates people, but narrativi narrativizes their experience. The archive is comprised of 250 manuscript pages of 42 documents collected from all three investigations. When I first examined this collection, the documents were out of order. Some of the pages were missing. The handwriting was difficult to interpret, and names of people were flung about without introductions, contexts, or explanatory notes. Armed with my magnifying glass and stapler, I worked feverishly to unite separated pages and decipher faded or cryptic handwriting so that I could hear how the story unfolded page by page with a plot that delivered one piece of the story at a time. I created an Excel file to keep track of the major players and their accusations of falsehood. Very quickly, however, I realized my mistake. There was no clear way to untangle the mess, for every piece of evidence not only claimed to state the truth, but accused all the rest of telling lies. My initial solution was to write to the University of Southampton when the archive is housed. Perhaps they'd neglected to make copies of all the pages in their collection. Maybe one or two fell behind the desk. No, they assured me, of the entire collection. Nothing is missing. It's complete. It wasn't until my third or fourth 
began to understand the gravity of the missing pieces, even if they were not technically missing from the archive. A few letters mentioned that evidence was destroyed by cover-ups on the part of those leading the investigations. In other cases, the archive was silent about its gaps, leading, leading me to wonder if the loss was intentional, or if it was the inevitable fate of an old archive squirreled away in a library filing cabinet. Even more curious, Why did the 1853 investigation choose to ignore, but deliberately save, the body of testimony labeled Appendix F? Why would they create an intentional hole in the story and then save that hole, marking it as disqualified? As I read further, I began to understand the implications of the evidence in Appendix F. One of the longer and more detailed testimonies was a transcription of Meyer Levy's statement. Children and servants from the institution were called into a room to testify in front of members of the education subcommittee, where they were prompted by questions. As they answered, a transcriber recorded their responses. The transcribers had varying writing abilities. Some neglected to use punctuation or misspelled names. Others inserted commentary or corrections, such as, the children used to call the teacher by this name, but really it was something else. At every turn, forced to remember that the transcriptions were not an accurate record of the speaker's voices. Still, the documents were understood to be accurate enough among members of the 1853 committee to make the decision to disqualify all of the Appendix F testimony. Meyer Levy's account stood out for a number of reasons. While several adults spoke boldly against either the superintendents the Franklins, or the newly hired headmaster, Meyer Davis. Meyer Levy was one of the only children to speak directly against his teachers. Also telling, as we shall see, is the fact that he returns repeatedly throughout the archival record, either by offering additional evidence of student misconduct or as a subject of other people's testimonies. In his Appendix F testimony, Meyer Levy is asked to basic autobiographical details. He states that he was a former inmate of the asylum. At the time he offered his testimony in 1853, this is the Appendix F, um, first testimony uh, in, uh, investigation, he was 14 and a half years old and lived at Eight Princes Place in St. George's where he worked as an apprentice to Mr. Solomon's of 38 Great Prescott Street. He adds that he was 11 and a half remained for two and a half years. During this period, Mr. Franklin was master of the son. Meyer Levy moves on to address questions about a fellow schoolmate named Joel Lyons. Meyer Levy explains, Placed under my care, I had to wash and dress and keep him, meaning um, this other student, Joel Lyons, um, and had to keep him clean in every respect. I liked him. He was obstinate, but would do anything on talking to him. Two or three days after he came in, he was observed to have a dirty head. Lice were found in the bed, and Leah Joles, a girl about 14 who made the bed, she told me of it. I had already observed it and was trying to get rid of them without saying a word to anyone, because if a boy comes in with anything, it is always thrown in his face afterwards. Leah Joel told me of it, and that Mrs. Franklin wanted to see if I was going to keep it secret, and I then told the other boys. I should have been punished had I kept it secret. I was ordered to comb his head half an hour every morning and with a small tooth comb. Leah Joel told me she got several cuts on the hand from Mrs. Franklin for telling me. Mrs. Franklin went up one day to examine the bed, and she asked Leah Joel if there was anything the matter with the boy's bed. Leah Joel said, what boy's bed? Mrs. Franklin replied, you know very well. Leah Joel said, Joel Lyon has a dirty head. Mrs. Franklin said, I want to find out if Meyer Levy was deceitful. We were called deceitful if we kept anything secret, and we were bribed by having things left at dinner given to us, or things taken from another boy's share to put to ours. After this, Joel Lyon was generally very wild in school, and disturbed 
sometimes be reported to Mr. Franklin and go without his tea and be locked in the wash house. This passage details a great number of disturbing problems, only a few of which were considered horrible enough to inspire an investigation. Meyer Levy withholds information about Joel Lyons's lice to avoid punishment. He maintains that Joel Lyons was obstinate but would do anything on talking to him. Both the speaker, Meyer Levy, and the subject, Joel Lyons, appear to be engaged in acts of processing information logically. This testimony orders their experiences by suggesting that they were not just difficult children, but their disobedient behavior stemmed from their desire to avoid punishment. Moreover, Meyer Levy shares more than plot details. His structuring of the account seems to vindicate his actions and those of his friend. For example, according to this testimony, Joel Lyons' only crime is his act of reacting rationally and honestly in an environment ruled by lies. As Meyer Levy explains, we were called deceitful if we kept anything secret and were bribed by having things left at dinner or things taken from other, another boy's share. Meyer Levy suggests here that lying functioned strategically by asylum inmates as a self-conscious form of self-preservation. The act of lying, in other words, served as a vehicle for inmate solidarity, whereas a defensive performance enacted in the midst of a punishing system of power. Thus, he withholds information about Joel Lyons until he learns that Leah Joel's had her hands cut by Mrs. Franklin. He protects his friend until he learns that his own actions brought about the punishment of a servant. Levy continues his account with the description of Joel Lyons' act of publicizing the poor behavior of Mr. Franklin's son, Julius Franklin. On this occasion, he's thrashed. Meyer Levy explains. Meyer Levy explains, Abraham Cohen heard what Joel Lyons had said, went and told Mr. Franklin. Abraham Cohen was sent for the birch. He used to like to see the flogging. The little boys would be birched for wetting the bed. Abraham Cohen's brother was done so, and Emmanuel Cohen, a little Dutch boy, also. Israel Cohen. When the two, when the two last first came, While the other boys are silenced and afraid to speak, Joel Lyons speaks boldly of, of Julius Franklin's inappropriate behavior. As a consequence of telling an unwanted truth, Joel Lyons receives punishment. Importantly, even, uh, I'm sorry, each of Meyer Levy's answers deploys a cause and effect logic. Nothing happens by accident, but, but as an outcome of or reaction to physical abuse or poor behavior. Meyer Levy delivers his testimony the rhetoric of coolly presented events and an attention to psychological triggers and responses. Without mentioning the younger children's bedwetting, the passage would simply suggest that floggings were standard procedure. However, Meyer Levy's inclusion of the cause for these floggings heightens the impact of his narrative, suggesting that the punishment was not only wrong, but ill-suited to the offense. Although Meyer Levy moves on to speak of other events, he remains consistent in his awareness of the psychological complexity of the students' behavior. His goal, however, seems less focused on vindicating students than on outing teachers' mistreatment of the students, particularly the Franklins. In his final account of Lippmann Hyam's death, Meyer Levy seems concerned about justice. He explains, and this is the slide behind me, when he was dying, he was not used as he ought to have been used. He had no proper care taken. I'm sorry, he had no proper care taken of, nor any kindness shown him. He was separated from the other boys, but a boy would go up to him if the door was open, unknown to Mrs. Franklin, and ask Littman, do you want anything? Littman Hyams would be afraid to speak. I can't explain all, for I was not there long during his illness. Only a little before he came from Margate, Littman Hyams would be afraid to ask because it would be denied him if a boy was ill and wanted anything. He would have to get it out of his own money, and Littman had none. If he was sick, he would have to wipe up his mess himself, although he had scarcely any flesh on his body. On the morning he died, at about half past three, 
He was calling some of the boys. He slept in our room. He was only separated in the daytime. He kept to his bed. I went to him and asked what he wanted. His mind wandered. I went to call his sister. She immediately came. A little before five, I went to call Mr. Franklin. He said he would come. Instead of doing so, he never came into the room until about 20 minutes to nine. And the child died about 15 minutes to nine. There was no doctor and no watcher. Mr. Franklin gave uh, S. Phillips, who's Simon Phillips, we'll hear about him in a minute. Um, Mr. Franklin gave S. Phillips order to say if any gentleman or other person knew of it and asked if proper attention was paid to say Mr. Franklin was attending on him before four in the morning. Simon Phillips was first told because he was going about to fetch the watcher and others, and Mr. Franklin told the other boys the same afterwards. While these events occurred when Myra Levy was 11, even at the relatively young age of 14, when he offers this testimony, Meyer Levy frames the event as a sequence of failures. Once again, this presentation emphasizes causes and effects, which create a form of logic aimed at heightening the intensity of the outrage. Along the way, he fleshes out the culture of the asylum, or the health implications in this case, of a child's inability to pay someone to clean up his mess. Meyer Levy insists that Mr. Franklin should have come to the aid of the dying child, and some adults should have called for help. At the very least, a doctor or a watcher to guard over his body between death and burial, a common Jewish custom, should have been called in during the final hours of the child's life. This moment points as well to a network of corruption, uh, not just on the part of teachers, but one that cut across teacher-student lines. Meyer Levy's outrage at Whitman-Hyam's treatment in the asylum is thus further compelled by his awareness of a conspiracy of silence that protected faculty and granted special privileges to certain students. Why would we believe Meyer Levy? Children often don't understand the complexities of the choices adults make. If we assume Mr. Franklin is innocent, it's entirely possible to read this event as a child's mistaken understanding of another child's misfortune. Perhaps the doctor visited uh, hours earlier to say that there was no hope of recovery, which would explain Mr. Franklin's choice not to come to the bedside in the middle of the night. Alternately, another sick child may have drawn Mr. Franklin away from Whitman-Hyam's bed. Or maybe we're better off reading the subtext of Meyer Levy's testimony as nothing more than an admission of fear and helplessness. It seems logical, after all, that an 11-year-old child would desire the presence of an adult on the terrifying occasion of another child's death. In her study of 18th century fictional orphan narratives, Cheryl Nixon notes that, quote, the orphan signals the ability of the self to achieve order by organizing his or her narrative. The orphan plots success by plotting the self. The orphan must not only take control of his or her life, but must take control of his or her story. Ultimately, the orphan may have few resources, but proves to have one source of power, narrative, that cannot be taken away. Meyer Levy's account is not a novel, of course, but he engages in a similar kind of plotting in his memory of fear, injustice, and helplessness. He speaks on subjects of his choosing. He boldly offers, at the young age of 14, a scathing critique of a teacher's refusal to grant dignity to a dying child, followed by a cover. Meyer Levy's testimony restores emotional triggers and psychological complexity to the children of the asylum. Children lied or behaved out of turn, he claims, because they were responding to an event, a lie, a system of abuse, and not because they were engaging in random acts of misconduct. Regardless of whether we read this testimony as a pack of lies or a statement of truth, Meyer Levy's ordering of events speaks to a kind of truth, that is, an individual conscience and a knowledge of social forces against and through which he voices his outrage. The 1853 committee made the decision to disqualify Meyer Levy's testimony. Luckily, it was saved, because the third investigation of 1857, as we shall see, would use this document to overturn conclusions 
made by the Middle Investigation in 1856. Also saved in Appendix F is the testimony of Simon Phillips, another prominent figure in the archive whose name resurfaces in several documents. The following passage from Simon Phillips' 1853 testimony offers a striking contrast to Myra Levy's account. Simon Phillips states, Remember Littman Himes was, the, was in the asylum before me. Recollect him being ill. Recollect his returning from Margate. Mr. Franklin kept him in the parlor and was very kind to him. Used to give him what he wanted, I think. He used to sleep in the boy's bedroom. This continued until he died. Can't recollect at what time he died. Remember Joel Lyons coming into the asylum. He was always a very bad boy. He would not do what Mr. Franklin told him. He was striking fighting, quarreling with the other boys, and disturbing the classes. Recollect Abraham Cohen. He was generally a good boy. He was liked by the boys. I believe I liked him very well. Simon Phillips' testimony stands awkwardly against Meyer Levy's, not only because they contradict one another, as the Committee of 1853 put it, but because of the different ways in which they order and narrativize information. Whereas Meyer Levy's account connects emotional dots and weaves together relations between events and human responses to those events, Simon Phillips speaks in bullets. He does not spend time remembering or embellishing. He observes behavior, but never considers the provocations for that behavior. The disqualifying transcript of Simon Phillips' brief account is complicated by four subsequent documents that were included and presumably considered in the 1857 investigation. Simon Phillips' sister, P. Abraham's unsolicited letter of the 11th of February, 1857, in three pieces of evidence Simon Phillips submitted over the course of a few hours, um, constitute these four documents. I'm suggesting, and as we shall see, these documents are better read as an entangled network of responses rather than a series of documents creating Somewhat ironically, although each testimony or letter is created uh, out of a plotting of events, it is contextualized by other documents that immerse it in the disorder of the lying archive, where fingers point and accusations attempt to discredit every account. There is no stable ground in this archive, even as individual voices claim such ground for themselves. In her letter, P. Abrahams offers one of the most direct Franklin's are violent and corrupt, and her brother Simon Phillips is not to be trusted. Before reading these criticisms, however, it's helpful to begin by tracing signs of her motives for writing this letter. She explains, I hereby forward you the following. I do this not out of revenge or animosity against Mr. and Mrs. Franklin, but for the truth's sake only, and if possible, to put an end to their unusual conduct toward the children. I have heard continued complaints of ill treatment and wickedness going on, but took no further notice after the treatment of Mr. Franklin to me on a previous occasion. And there being three younger children left, or siblings, other siblings enrolled in the school, who would have suffered had I interfered earlier. I am the mother of five children, and do this in the hopes that the poor orphan children will be put under better protection and teaching. I have often warned the condition of the children being brought up to lying, neighboring, falsehood, spying on each other, bad language, and trickery of every description. I have no fear of the three siblings telling the truth, but Simon is yet under Mr. Franklin's influence, and I would wish you not to rely on any statement he might make in Mr. Franklin's favor. As should he appear before you, it is only, again, by me bribery. His appearance would be contrary to my wishes. I am his older sister by 20 years and would have come forward myself, but that my household duties kept me entirely at home. P. Abraham sounds demure and dutiful in her stated objectives. She seeks only the truth and a better, safer environment for the children. She would have spoken up earlier, she claims, but since her three younger siblings were still enrolled, she worried her complaints might be them. And she would have offered testimony in person, but after all, as a mother of 
She's got household duties that must come first. These kinds of submissive acts often appear in preparatory material in 19th century publications by women, particularly in prefaces to their work, where they make statements that undercut their literary authority as women. They serve to assure readers that the author is not stepping out of line by writing a novel or a collection of poems. P. Abrahams knows her place, she assures us, as a woman, a mother, or a wife. Now, Zima Davis notes that these kinds of truthful accounts register the fictional qualities of archival documents. She notes, quote, by fictional, I don't mean their feigned elements, but rather using the other and broader sense of the word, fingering, their forming, shaping, and molding elements, the crafting of the narrative. Evidence of P. Abraham's crafting strategies is hard to miss. Her careful detailing of the horrific attacks against children and her assertions of earnest meekness as a dutiful mother stand in sharp contrast with her choice to submit a scathing critique of the Franklins and her brother in a letter she was never invited to write. Abraham moves on to discredit her brother and to restore credibility to Meyer Levy. In fact, this letter showcases one of the most important features of the archive. The weight of the investigation seems to have rested upon the comp competing testimonies of the two boys, Simon Phillips and Meyer Levy, both of whom were deliberately ignored by the first and second investigations. Yet, testimony from P. Abrahams, and as we shall see, Montague Leverson in 1857, appropriates the earlier Appendix F document. Eight days after P. Abraham submits her letter, her brother Simon Phillips writes one of his own. More correctly, he writes one and a half of his own. He then offers spoken testimony in the third document. In the first document, his handwritten, uh, his handwritten letters, uh, he accuses the Franklins of misconduct. In the second partial letter, he writes what seems to be a draft copy of the first letter that somehow strangely found its way into the archive. The third piece of evidence retracts the previous two documents and argues instead that the Franklins have been kind and that his sister Esther and her husband uh, were forced him to write these false statements against the Franklins. Read together, these three documents expose a level of confusion and distress, just as disturbing as the allegations of lies. For these letters and retractions suggest that Simon Phillips was pulled in several directions by family and teacher royalties. It's worth looking at each of these letters to trace the contours of his confusion or complicity, depending on how one reads these letters, and to remember that they were composed over the course of just a few hours. In his first letter, dated 19th of February, 1857, Simon Phillips writes, Sir, Mr. Franklin has asked me to come up to the committee and speak, for I promised to do so. But since then, I find he's been telling me falsehoods. To mislead me, he has endeavored to make my sisters out to be thieves, which he and I know to be false. They have spoken the truth. Now I wish to support them in their statements. I gave them, now I wish to support them in their statements. I gave uh, Mr. Franklin a good character before because I was under his influence and was forced to do any questions you may ask me, I promise honestly to tell the whole truth. I am your obedient servant, Simon Phillips. The second letter, in the same handwriting, with the same date and address as the above letter, states, Sir, Mr. Franklin has asked me to come up to the committee to say what both Mr. Franklin and me knows to be false. I did so once before. The remainder of the page is blank. However, a third document, a transcription of Simon Phillips' testimony contains his name with the same date as the previous two letters, February 19, 1857, and is marked by having been written at 12 o'clock midnight, Thursday night. The transcription reads, I, Simon Phillips, formerly an inmate of the Jews' Orphan Asylum, have come to the asylum to make the following statement. I have always been treated in the most parental manner by Mr. and Mrs. Franklin, both while I was in the institution and since I left it. And I had promised Mr. and Mrs. Franklin to make a statement to the committee to that effect. This promise I made without any inducement being held out and merely from motives of gratitude 
to my former bed. <coughs> Since then, my sister Esther Davis and my brother-in-law Henry Davis uh, have been endeavoring to poison my mind against Mr. and Mrs. Franklin by telling me that they have stated the most disgraceful untruths against my sisters Esther and Hannah and have tried to prevent me from speaking the truth to the committee. They excite my feelings, conjuring me by my dead parents to speak my, uh, to speak against my benefactors. Henry Davis brought me a document for me to sign, and I twice refused to do so. He, however, so worked upon my feelings that in a moment of madness, signed the paper at last. Since then, I have not had a moment of peace of mind, and I have now come down here to speak the truth and to express my deep regret for the rash act which I have committed. This statement is perfectly true in every respect, and I intend to state the same to the committee. In the first document, his writing seems disjointed, confused even. He mentions an earlier case of supporting Mr. Franklin, presumably the testimony I read a little while ago from Appendix F. But several hours later, he tells another version of the story, this time in a transcription by someone more adept at using punctuation and specific format references. The document in the middle, a tiny, incomplete fragment, leads us to believe he revised his work. He wanted to get it right, or perhaps he wanted to sound more authoritative, and so he took the time to write and rewrite. The archive has long been thought of a place to find primary materials, materials that feel raw, unedited, more real somehow. Recent work in archival studies by M. R. Stoller, Antoinette Burton, and Anjali Rondekar, to name just a few, has rightly caused us against, uh, I'm sorry, cautioned us against the temptation to read archival fragments as an accurate encounter with reality. In the case of the Jews' orphan asylum archive, we find new reasons for reading, as Stoller puts it, against the archival brain, looking at these materials not as sources, but as subjects, as texts, that ought not to be read at face value. I've tried to suggest models for reading the voices from the Jews' orphan asylum as subjects of systems of power, historical constructions of gender, and evidence of abuse manifested through a child's divided loyalties. However, one of the last pieces of evidence a single letter written by Montague Leverson spins the thread of evidence in a new direction. In his letter, written February 16, 1857, Montague Leverson explains that he forwards a letter received unsuspectedly from Meyer Levy, one of the boys examined between three and four years ago, this is a quote, one of the boys examined between three and four years ago by the Committee of Investigation, end quote. That is, in the 1853 investigation. Leverson recalls that Meyer Levy's testimony and that of others was clamored down by the, the general committee in the statement made by a Mr. Alexander Levy. According to that statement, Meyer Levy allegedly, allegedly, confessed to lying in his testimony. To make matters worse, Alexander Levy claimed that not only did the child lie, but that he was bribed by Montague Leverson to make such falsehoods. This, we discover, was the real reason for disqualifying the evidence in Appendix F. Montague Leverson's 1857 letter introduces and recovers, in part at least, a lost document, a new letter from Meyer Davis explaining that he was not bribed and his evidence in the 1853 archive was the truth. While the investigating team sought to expose liars and fraud in the institution, according to Leverson, they used their investigation as a form of subterfuge to distract the board from noticing that the education committee itself was thoroughly corrupt. In fact, this one single accusation has the power to bring the entire body of evidence into suspicion of a new kind. In the end, the 1857 report overturned the initial findings. The Franklins were sacked, and Mr. Davis was exonerated. In other words, justice sided the views of Meyer Levy, P. Abrahams, and Montague Leverson, and not the views of Simon Phillips. One of the most important pieces of evidence, which I haven't had time to discuss, uh, is Meyer Davis's, and let me just add, there's a lot of these names sound very similar, but none of these people are related, um, and that's why I'm using their first and second name. 
Um, so one of the most important pieces of evidence, which I haven't had time to discuss today, is Meyer Davis's incomplete 91-page memoir, where he charts the series of devastating events that led him to be fired by the 1856 investigation. He was vindicated by the 1857 investigation, in part, I suspect, because of Montague Leverson's letter. Meyer Davis, however, had several documents in the archive, one of which is a letter dated November 5, 1856, just after beginning his new position as headmaster, in which Mr. Davis writes to Montague Leverson, who at the time was president um, of the board. Uh, and he writes in this letter, Friday is the scholar's feast, and with your permission, we shall have a holiday, as at other establishments. I found this letter tantalizing when I stumbled upon it. This Jewish holiday, still in practice among some Ashkenazi communities, takes place on the eighth month of the Hebrew calendar. The scholar's feast is also sometimes called Lag Amar, uh, or the 33rd day of Omer, uh, is in the words of the 19th century Reverend John Mills, uh, was instituted to commemorate the tradition concerning the plague that raged among scholars of the celebrated Rabbi Akiva, which after destroying a great number of scholars, 24,000 according to the Talmud, ceased all of a sudden as by a miracle on the 18th of this month. A feast is held to remember the miracle that ended the killing of the scholars. Why do we not all celebrate this event? <laughs> it is celebrated by lighting of bonfires and feasting, a celebration of light, food, and an end to the destruction of the plague. Meyer Davis's allusion to the scholars' feast reminds me of the ways in which archives celebrate heard voices from unpublished manuscripts, dead to us until we find a way to hear them. Opening the archive brings them back into circulation. But despite their fascinating terms of phrase, their idiosyncratic use of punctuation, their deployment of literary tropes, and their hedging of the truth, in the end, we are left with an assemblage, assemblage of narratives that do not cohere, and that remain forever entangled in the same archival folder. This is nothing short of a scholar's feast. It's through the mixed up incompleteness and excesses of the archive where we hear the Jews' orphan asylum expose sparks of something real, emerge through a panoply of lies. While my encounter with this archive has created moments of hope, of clarity, of illumination, it has also required acts of letting go, of learning when and how to accept the boundaries and limits of the archive's contents. Thus, in the end, we will never know the truth of the scandal of the Jews' orphan asylum archive, but we nevertheless witness the archive faded ink and brittle pages, narratives pushed against powerful cultural